Tonight, Robert Bean Blossom and Richard Files will present Time's Running Out, a historical perspective of a movie and the fight against Southern West Virginia forest fires. The documentary Time's Running Out was made in 1969 by Wheeling, Wheeling uh, filmmaker Ellis Dungan for the Cooperative Extension Service of the West Virginia Center for Appalachian Studies and Development and the Division of Forestry of the West Virginia Department of Natural Resources. Scholars and educators with the Cooperative Extension Service thought that a well-made film might be able to lower the number of forest fires in southern West Virginia. Our first speaker will be Dick Faust, who is the audio moving images archivist and has worked at Archives and History since 1982. He is a longtime member of the Association of Moving Image Archivists and a founding member of the group's local television task force steering committee. He was honored by AMIA in 2002 with its Dan and Kathy Leah Award for Service to the Archival Community. Please welcome Dick Faust. Thanks, Randy. Uh, I'm going to start out by talking about uh, Alice Duncan, but 37 years ago, tonight's speaker and I had never met, but we had something in common. We were both impressed by the film we were going to show tonight uh, as part of our historic presentation and discussion. I saw this film for the first time about 1975 or 76. I was working as a research assistant for the Institute for Labor Studies and as part of continuing education. So I think we had this film in our film library. So I thought, well, this is some kind of a film about labor history, and I put it on a projector and showed it. Well, it wasn't at all about labor history, but I did think it was a very interesting film. It grabbed my attention immediately and held it throughout the film. And I also thought it ended in an unusual and unique way. I thought the film was very well made, and I think it was the first film I'd ever seen made by someone named Ellis Dunga. Well, little did I know that some almost 40 years later, I would have the honor of having the, West, the Ellis Dunga film collection here at the West Virginia State Archives. And, uh, and I would also have the privilege of introducing a person who knows a great deal about this film, and that's uh, Bob Bean Blossom. Uh, <clears throat> before I introduce Bob, I want to talk about Ellis Duncan. For those of you not familiar with Ellis Duncan, there is a uh, excellent book called A Guide to Adventure. And if anybody's interested, I have a few copies here, courtesy of Chris Bowie, uh, Ellis Duncan's stepson, and Ellis had a very special relationship with him, um, and uh, he had a few copies and let us have them here at the archives. I should also mention that as a young man, Ellis Duncan had a professional movie making career in, of all places, India. Uh, and he recently, uh, there was a documentary made by an Indian filmmaker Current Valley, about uh, called an American and Madness, which is about Ellis Dungan's Indian filmmaking career. Uh, he went to India as a young man and uh, spent some spent about 15 years in India. And so uh, this this film is good enough. Uh, this film about Ellis Dungan that it's making the rounds of Indian film festivals is uh, shown in several in India made the New York Indian Film Festival, and in about three weeks it's going to make the London Indian Film Festival, which is no small accomplishment. But he, uh, he talks a little about Ellis's career, as we know him in West Virginia. We knew him as a talented regional documentary filmmaker here at Mystic. That's how he, we knew him. I do have a few pictures of Ellis's career uh, that I want to show, just sort of to show you he was kind of a uh, big time, or, you know, filmmaker in India. He was a professional, and I'm going to have Randy help me with the, with the film, with the uh, pictures. 
Ellis Duncan was born in 1909 in Bartonville, Ohio, Bartonville, Ohio. He graduated from St. Clairsville High School in 1927. Even before he graduated from high school, he traveled to New York and Washington, and he, he loved to travel. He had a spirit for adventure. So he, uh, uh, after high school, he decided to travel further. Let's see if I can advance this. And uh, spent some time in Spain and in Paris, and ended up, uh, for a young guy, this is pretty good, he ended up working at the American Library in Paris. And I may have the sequence out a little bit out of order, but uh, uh, he, uh, I think this American Library in Paris is after he attended Long Beach University, Long Beach uh, uh, I don't have that down, Long Beach Junior College. But he ended up working here after this, then he went to the University of Southern California and was once in the first filmmaking school class. And he, uh, while he was there, one of his classmates was from India and he, he said, you know, my dad's gonna build this film studio and he'd like you to come to India and help me make films. So he, he did and uh, I mean, this is, these are some pictures of him in India. You can, let's see, let me get this pointer going right. So that's Ellis there. And you can see he, these were feature films he directed. Here you can tell there's, there's Ellis there. And, and again, you're starting to, there. And he, he got to film some breathtakingly good scenery in India. And he was also ended up being pretty good with you know, uh, animal photography. And you can see him down there shooting for a picture. And he, uh, there was one story about him, he never fired a gun, but he did uh, manage to shoot, uh, to film a tiger, I think it was, uh, charging at him. And uh, he, he said it wasn't very good with the gun, but he was pretty good with the camera, so. Uh, And this is uh, him, him uh, and some of his colleagues editing a film. You can see this contraption he's working on, which is a, basically a movieola has splicing equipment in it. And of course, that's, that's that was there. Um, I should mention during his 15 years in India, Ellis became especially good in three areas that would help him out with this film. We're about to see, but we'll see after, after Bob introduces it. I should, and I think I did say these are full-fledged feature films. Uh, and so the movie posters and everything, you can uh, see he's, he's uh, the director. And uh, the one of the things he developed in India was he was adept at adapting a local story for a larger purpose or empathizing with local culture. This would help him when he made this film, Time's Running Out. He was good at wildlife cinematography and he was also good at outdoor photography in general. Uh, now, I'm going to turn this over in a few minutes to Bob, and he's a principal speaker. He knows the most about this film, and he'll tell you about how it was made. Uh, I, I knew when after I met Bob that he was been knowledgeable, outstanding public servant. Servant. And about a year ago, we started talking about this movie, and we realized we both liked it. And I realized Bob knew a whole lot about it, and that's why we wanted to decide we'd have a, have a program. Uh, so now to formally introduce Bob, uh, Robert Bean Blossom is a Mingo County native who joined the West Virginia Department of Natural Resources Division of Forestry in 1973 as a forest ranger and supervised forest fire control activities in his home county. In 1980, he transferred to DNR's Parks and Recreation se Section as the superintendent of the Panther State Forest in McDowell County, 
where he was charged with the administration of eight and an eight thousand acre state forest. Later was superintendent of Water Smith Memorial State Park before being promoted in 1989 to regional administrator with supervision of 25 state parks and forests. Bob Bean Blossom is a member of the West Virginia Recreation and Parks Association and a life member of the West Virginia University Forestry Alumni Association. Also, he has held several positions with the Society of American Foresters and has served on the West Virginia Fire Mobilization Advisory Council, Governor's Advisory Committee for the State Forester, Governor's Advisory Committee on State-Owned Forests, and routinely accepts incident management team assignments and is deployed as a public information officer to critical wildlife situation, situations and other emergencies throughout the United States. And this is very interesting here. Uh, Bob Bean Blossom edited the third edition of the histories of the Southeastern State Park Systems, that's in 2011, and was presented the May C. Landrum History Award at the National Association of State Park Directors Conference in Iowa this past September for his effort. So it is my great pleasure to finally get around to bringing Bob up to the podium to tell us more about the making of time running out. Thank you, Dave. Uh, I was one of those kids that uh, was real fortunate. I knew from the time that I was in grade school what I was going to do, and that was to become a forester. And I stayed with me through high school, and I read everything I could, did everything I could to learn about the profession in an early age, and, and that was kind of difficult growing up in Bingo County, where very little people knew about conservation and the importance of protecting their natural resources. <clears throat> but anyway, I was fortunate enough to go to the uh, forest industries camp uh, between my junior and senior year in high school in 1970, and I first saw this movie. And it just came out, and, and they showed it uh, during the time when we were in the camp. And one of the principals was saw it by named Bill Crabb. And Bill and I became good friends. And Anyway, I asked Bill if it would be possible for me to get that film and show it in Mingo County. Well, he said that would be no problem, so I went back, talked to my principal, and in my senior year in high school, I skipped school and went around showing this, this film out of schools throughout Mingo County. So that was my first real recollection of this movie. But, why Southern West Virginia? After we show this film, I'm going to talk a little bit about why we have such a fire problem in, in West Virginia, particularly in Southern West Virginia. And when I say Southern West Virginia, I mean Fayette, McDowell, Raleigh, Wyoming, Boone, Kanawha, Lincoln, Logan, Mingo, and Wayne counties. Historically, they have been a real problem and a real difficult problem to solve whenever it comes to uh, reducing fire occurrence. Uh, from 1951 to 1960, an average of 1,500 fires burned in this state, most of it in southern West Virginia, and burned around 133,000 acres a year. The fall of 52 was absolutely the worst fire season ever recorded since the inception of fire control efforts in 1909. Uh, over 600,000 acres burned that fall. Uh, although the situation is changing a little bit more in recent years, uh, uh, Director Pete Sandville, who was uh, DNR Director, noted in 1968 that it's a grim paradox that a 10 county area in southern West Virginia, which has only 29% of the state's acreage, accounts for 65% of the total number of fires in the Mountain State, and the burn area average 80, averages 84% of the state's total burn acreage. So you can see we really have a problem. And I'll talk a little bit more after the movie as to why. But against this backdrop of all of this problem, and very little money to deal with it, Several novel approaches occurred or came out forward in the late uh, 
1960s, uh, primarily uh, under the leadership of uh, Pete Sansel, who was DNR director of the end, and Lester McClung, who was state forester in charge of the division of forestry. A couple of those things that occurred, there was a pilot program that was launched down in Wyoming County to beef up suppression efforts and increase fire prevention activities. And that effort was mainly spearheaded by a forester by the name of Bill Maxey. Bill later served as state forester in West Virginia, but at the time, he was a forester with the Georgia Pacific Corporation. Uh, they made some good progress in reducing the acreage burden because they developed some train crews and paid them a little bit more, and they were able to, to reduce the acreage burden, but they did not make or did not have much success with regard to fire prevention. Bill was real fond of saying when he went to Wyoming County in 1959, they were averaging 100 fires a year. And when he left in 1967 to go to the university, they were averaging 100 fires a year. Uh, another thing that occurred was that the Division of Forestry asked the uh, feds to come in, the U.S. Forest Service, and do an administrative study of the fire problem and come up with recommendations. Uh, that program started in August of 1967 with a meeting with Director Sansel and uh, the staff of the Division of Forestry, and, and two foresters from the U.S. Forest Service came down and spent weeks meeting with foresters, fire control personnel, landowners, companies, and so forth, and to develop some recommendations that could be uh, implemented. And they produced a report called a Green Paradox, which, which uh, I read from you a while ago about Sample's comments about, you know, the, the acreage and, and the amount burned down there. And uh, they recommended about $600,000 be spent at the time. Uh, give you an idea of what they were faced with. Uh, now, remember, this is in $1967. Kentucky at the time was spending 10.2 cents uh, an acre for fire protection. Ohio and Pennsylvania was 11.7 cents per acre. Virginia was 14 cents an acre, and West Virginia was 5.7 cents, almost half of what other surrounding states were spending for fire protection. And that hasn't changed too much. That's about probably what we today. Another thing that they did was that uh, Samsel and uh, Lester McClung uh, tackled the railroad fire problem. Our railroads uh, caused numerous fires then, uh, primarily through hot carbon that spewed out of these diesel locomotives, you think when these ones, the diesel, diesel the problem would be in, but it never. And also from things like what we call hot boxes or, uh, or uh, brakes locking up on a car and, and throwing off hot pieces of metal used to touch off a lot of fires. Back when I started, I got to know the claims agent with the N &W on a first name basis. I'd go in and hand him about seven or eight tickets out of whack. So we got to know each other pretty well. Another thing that they did, uh, there was some thought that if you got hunters in the woods early down in southern West Virginia and got them out before the leaves fell and the woods dried out to become a fire problem, uh, then that might reduce fire currents. So they started in the fall of 1967 a early squirrel season. Squirrel season and these 10 southern counties came in in mid-September and still in October. Uh, they studied it for five years and they really found that it really didn't have much effect and they discontinued it. Another thing that they tried, and I was involved in this a little bit, they launched a five-year fire protection program in Logan County. And it was centered around Arbor Day. And the idea was that every child would be contacted by division forestry personnel and presented with a tree. And if you take that tree home 
Right? That child took that tree home and planted it on the hill behind his house, it would be less likely uh, to allow mommy and daddy to let fire out. Well, that was a good idea. But I maintain it met with mixed success. Because the folks that you really needed them to, to reach, some of the folks that lived in the head of the hall, so to speak, that were part of the true Appalachian culture, that was part of the pro that was mainly the problem that was creating all the fires, were a little superstitious when it came to tree planting. Have any of you heard this story? You know, in Appalachian culture, there's a superstition that if you plant a tree, when it becomes large enough to shade a grave, someone will die. And if you think of that, it has some validity because by the time a tree reaches 25, 30 years of age, probably someone in that family is or has reached an age where they're likely to pass away. <clears throat> now, I'm, I'm not clear about what the connection was or how it came about that the Division of Forestry and the Extension Service cooperated in producing this field. But anyway, uh, I'm, I'm sure it's linked to some of these other initiatives. Um, but the WVU's Cooperative Extension Service uh, latched on to about $50,000 and produced this film. Uh, it was a, uh, the world premiere of the movie was held at Van Elementary in Boone County in October of 1969. The script was primarily written by a lady by the name of Barbara Wade, who was formerly with WSAZ TV in Huntington, and then, and then a lady by the name of Wileen Dial, who was a Lincoln County Cooperative Extension agent, was a dialogue consultant. Uh, Bill Kidd, who was another close friend of mine, who was a cooperative extension forester at Morgantown, assisted with the, with the uh, script. He told me that he and, and uh, Paul Yazell drove to Huntington to meet with uh, uh, Norman Simpkins from Marshall University. And by the time they drove back to Morgantown, then Paul Yazell pretty much had the script outline. Uh, uh, of what it would be. And then Bill Grafton, uh, who was at Beckley at the time with the Cooperative Extension Service, uh, was involved in uh, doing most of the field work. And then folks like Ashley Kelly and Jack Killinghast and Isaac Carpenter and all went a hand. Uh, a couple of things that you'll see in the movie. Uh, back in uh, all some of you may remember, between 1960 and 1966, uh, there was a country music show that was on WCHS TV that was called the Buddy Starfish Show. And then after 1966, through its demise in 1973, it was called the Sleepy Jeffers Show. There was a local singing duo, uh, Honey and Sunny the Davis Twins, and they were regulars on the show, and they approached Sonny about singing this theme song that you'll hear in the video, the time's running out. Uh, Sonny <clears throat> remembers that uh, he recorded this song in the studios of WTIP Radio, a local country music station here in Charleston, and uh, Sleepy Jeffers and uh, Herman Roscoe Yarborough did the instrumentals. Uh, currently, uh, he's living in Lima, Ohio, and I was able to track him down and talk to him about it. But he told me he was selected because he was the number one local country music singer disc, disc jockey in southern West Virginia. Uh, when this film came out, it cost $114, I think. But anyway, you, you'll notice, and I'll mention this again, that, that it specifically mentioned the southern West Virginia. But other states were so impressed with this movie that they ordered copies of it for their fire prevention, prevention programs. Now, a little bit more about the movie. There'll be a scene in there 
uh, if you don't want the flyers, it's on the, the flyer. But it depicts a fire crew breaking the fire line. Well, that particular scene was staged at Oro Lake uh, Wildlife Clinic when they were down in Minger County. And the individuals were employed by uh, the Work Incentive Program, which was a job training program designed to assist those on welfare to find marketable skills at the time. There was a scene in there of a forest ranger sitting under a truck and talking on the radio. And that individual was Ben White. Now, Ben had been a forest ranger, or they were called County Forest Protectors then. But at the time, he was the superintendent of Cooper Frog State Forest up in uh, Monongahela County. Um, there's a lot of scenes of deer and other wildlife scenes that were shot at Cooper Frog State Forest. There are scenes, to, the scenes that you'll see depicting the dead deer uh, that had been burned over uh, were staged using roadkill deer collected from county conservation officers. Um, in addition to providing funding for the movie, the Cooperative Extension Service also paid for the distribution of a brochure that could be passed out to audiences whenever the video was, was shown. The brochure contained the song and lyrics, uh, there's a theme, Time's Running Out, and provided a contact list of each forest ranger and each county extension agent that uh, you could call to report fires. Uh, there are several scenes of fire showers depicted in the movie. The first one that you'll see is, uh, is a scene of a fire tower that shot from a distance. That was a big mountain tower that was on the head of Lynn's Creek, and that, that uh, was shot while uh, the cameraman was standing in the middle of 119 there at the, the head of Lynn's Creek. Uh, the observer uh, depicted in the tower using a, an Allen Day or firefinder was an individual by the name of Oren Buford who lived down in Logan County and he was the observer of the Pickering Knob Tower which straddled the Logan Mingo County line on Holden 22 Mountain near the head of Pine Creek. Uh, Oren was very well liked by other fire tower observers and frequently was known to make funny, chatty comments. I know Elizabeth one day uh, talked to my observer and was telling him about eating ramps. And Oren said, yeah, I thought I smelled something funny coming out of the mic. <laughs> kind of silly, things like that. Uh, <clears throat> sandwiched between those, I think there's a sea of a fire on a hill overlooking some homes uh, between the two fire tower scenes. Pay particularly attention to that scene, and if you'll look real closely, you'll see the head of a boy running across the bottom of the screen. And it was this kid that showed up on a bicycle, and he was just kind of curious to see what was going on, and they needed that scene so they didn't edit it out. Uh, there was a man reporting the fire by telephone. Uh, that individual was a circuit judge of Boone County at the time. Uh, he was written into the movie simply because of his interest and support that was shown during the process. There's a jeep running down an old road. Uh, that jeep belonged to Isaac Carpenter, who was a field agent for Westmoreland Coal Company. Uh, Carpenter had previously been employed by the uh, Division of Forestry and he just died in May of 2003. Uh, there was a beech tree falling, presumably <coughs> caused by a hunter smoking out game. Uh, that shop was staged on the family farm of the Grafton family in Fayette County. The movie <coughs> was designed to, to address the specific leading causes of forest fires in southern West Virginia at the time. Smoking out game, you'll see, burning trash, arson, and one other that has really changed, and that is burning room sake. 
I can't find a Blue's Age field in Mingo or in southern West Virginia now. It's all grown up in the forest land. Uh, the fire also addressed some specific damages, uh, killing the young trees and seeds. Uh, cat faces. How many of you know what cat face is? Okay, you'll learn. You'll see a tree. Uh, you'll see a tree that's hollowed out at the base. That's called a cat face. And in probably almost every instance, particularly in southern West Virginia, that can be traced back to previous fire damage. Uh, it talks about job and economic losses. It talks about damage done to wildlife. Uh, damage done to flowers, especially the loss of hemlock thickets, because hemlock is a tree that's highly susceptible to fire damage. It talk, the, the video will also talk about the uh, effects of fire to uh, flooding and uh, uses some file footage from past flood events. Uh, I think maybe one scene might have even been taken from, during the 30s there when that what was the 37 flood that hit Huntington. It mentions the use of tax money or our tax dollars to fight fire. It talks about air pollution. But what really makes this movie unique is there were a lot of planning and forethought that went into it and the message was geared toward convincing people that lived and worked in our Appalachian culture of the need to prevent fires. Uh, for example, what you'll see here is a grandfather taking his two grandchildren on a walk through the woods. That was deliberate. <coughs> Because at the time, the grandfather was a head of the households in Appalachian culture. Not mother, not father, uncle, but grandfather. A, a patrician hierarchy. And they were used very specifically. Uh, there's repeated references to God playing upon the mountaineers of, uh, you know, uh, strict fundamentalist religion and, and devout religion. Uh, it, I mentioned earlier, it mentioned specifically Southern West Virginia. Uh, it, again, that was deliberate. The reference to the sense of place. And there's a strong sense of place in Appalachian culture. Uh, you'll hear some Words and phrases that are commonly, that were commonly used in Appalachian culture then, uh, such as spot fire, doting, and particularly rock dust, which was uh, the former name given to, to uh, black lung. When I was growing up, it wasn't black lung, it was rock dust. Now, uh, Dick mentioned the last scene in the movie. And I'll give away the ending because I think it's important. The last thing you'll see is the grandfather looks directly into the camera and says, how about it? We'll all help out, won't we? Uh, it was Norman Simpkins that recommended that because in Appalachian culture, very seldom is a direct appeal for aid refused. So with that, enjoy the movie and and then I'll look forward to some questions and maybe some comments afterwards. You know, I've walked these woods for nigh on 70 years. I well remember when times was good and they was loggers all around. Back then, when my granddad took me a walking in the woods, 
there was a heap more game, more hunting. Things just ain't the same no more. Yep, the forest is different. Lots of things has changed. Grandpa, what's different? Hey, <laughs> most folks are just like you. They just don't know all the damage a fire can do. And it's not just the trees. Fire hurts us too. Us and our kin folks and our neighbors all over these hills. We're paying a price, kids, for what we've done to our force. A mighty high price. I'll sing you a song, it's a sad tale but true, of a fire that burns on the hill. And the price that we're paying today, me and you, cause the forest is burning there still. Oh, we gotta pitch in, gotta put out the fire, cause our time's running out and the cost getting higher. It's funny, the way people will destroy the most valuable things they got and end up hurting themselves and their neighbors just because they're careless. Some fool hunter was smoking out a squirrel and started dissing. We had to fight that far three, four days before we done got to put it out. Dang fella got his squirrel, but he rent hundreds of acres of timber and killed a whole passel of wild game, too. Mostly, hunters don't aim to start fires, but they get carried away sometimes, and they get careless with fire. This one was started by a farmer burning off his fields to get ready for plowing. Lots of folks claim it's good for pasture land to burn it, but it ain't. Look at that soil. It was cream rich once. Now it's not fit to raise nothing but broom sage. The fire done destroyed all the topsoil that made it rich and helped the crops and trees to grow. Now, this one was caused by burning trash. There's a sight of folks that started out to burn their trash and ended up burning a whole mountain. Now, this here's the kind of fire that wears me the most. Done just for spite. Started by one of her own neighbors, it was. Done it a purpose. Just cause he got mad, maybe at the company. Or he got mad at his neighbor. And if that weren't bad enough, there was plenty of people could have done something about it. Just sat there and let her burn. Before long, it turned out to be a lot of folks responsible for that bar. And it was a big one. Thousands of acres scorched. Folks won't be forgetting about that one soon, especially them that almost lost their homes in the blaze. And it's sad to think that didn't nobody seem to realize the price they'd have to pay for all the fires. Seemed like they couldn't understand how they was hurting themselves. It started one night in a holler nearby, and it burned its way up the hill. It wasn't our land, but we hurt you and I, and we're paying a price for it still. Oh, we gotta pitch in, gotta do something fine, cause we're hurting ourselves and we don't have much time. Lots of folks figure that come next spring after the fire, everything will be all right. It looks pretty good. Sure, the mountainside looks green. Leastways it does from kind of fur off. But if you used to get up close, 
you could see for your own self how bad that fire messed things up. If you was to take a look around, you'd see the first thing that fire done was to kill all the young trees and saplings. Burn up all the seeds, too. Then, the longer she burns, the worse it is for the big trees. The fire don't kill them, so they still leaf out and look green. But just you go around to the yon side of them trees and have a look. See them marks? Timmerman calls them cat faces. Sure look like cat faces, Grandpa. Oftentimes you can't hardly see them from the roadside or the foot of the hill, just only from above. You've seen how the leaves and twigs piles up more on the uphill side of trees. Well, it just naturally stands on to burn faster than anything else around the tree. And that's what makes them cat faces. If you just leave the tree stand there, then it's either going to die off or else it'll get hot and won't be worth a nickel to nobody. Just an old cull standing there taking up room. Once it's got burned or scorched, the bark falls clean off. That makes the tree get doty, and it lets that foxfire stuff get a start on the dead wood. And finally what happens is the whole tree rots and falls over. When the logging crews come into a forest that's burned, they can't hardly find nothing. Just a few good logs here and there. So what it means is the more fires you have destroying the timber, the fewer timber cutting jobs there are. And damaged wood don't do the sawmills no good either. Fire hurts the trees most down at the bottom of the trunks right where they're worth the most money to you. That's where your top grade lumber comes from, and vanilla wood too. You know, you ain't supposed to use fire damaged wood for mine posts on account of them posts needs to be strong enough to hold up the roof. Nor you can't use fire damaged wood to sell to pulp and paper mill on account of they just won't take it. So, you see, fires take the money right out in their pockets. Yes, we're hurting ourselves, and we don't have much time. Have you ever studied about what fire does to the flowers and animals? God put flowers on earth for us to enjoy. And that's bound to mean he aimed for us to take care of them. But it's a pure out fact that flowers are the first to go, right along with the seedlings and ground cover, just as quick as the fire comes along. If the flowers have deep roots, might be they'd come up again next spring. Now on the other hand, this hill could look like this for a long time to come. And it's a cinch, there won't be no animals around here. The young ones was probably killed in the fire. And them that got away won't have no reason to come back for their homes and food is all gone. Here in southern West Virginia, hemlock thickets is a favorite shelter for deer and other animals. And the game bird likes them real well to roost in too. Now these here hemlock thickets has been the hardest hit by far. They are just plumb disappearing, and far is burning up the seeds and the little seedlings, which could give some shelter and food for the wildlife. Something a lot of folks never study about is what forest fires can do to the water. What does fire have to do with water, Grandpa? Makes a heap of difference, Jay, when it comes to rain up there whether the water falls on rich topsoil or on ground that's been just about burned bare naked. Mm -hmm. 
Many's the time I've seen the ground soak up the rain like it was a blotter. Catches hold of it and just hangs on. That's one reason why the woods stay moist and the trees and plants can grow. But you let that same rain fall in a place that's been burned and the water just slides clear down the hill quick as double-geared lightning. And when the ground cover can't hold back the water, it means trouble. Lots of things that ought to stay on the hill gets washed down off it. You lose your topsoil, fine topsoil that won't ever be back. You get sandbars in the creeks too, and the water gets all fouled up. And if it keeps on raining, those headwaters come pouring down the hollers and valleys. The first thing you know, you've got yourself a flood. Now, floods is just like fires. It's a sight to the world how much money they cost. After the high water's gone, you gotta patch up the roads, build back the bridges, fix up the houses, and all the rest of the stuff that got tore up. And where do they get the money from to do all that? From our taxes, that's where. I'd a heap rather see it go for better roads and better schools. It ain't only the creeks and rivers that gets fouled up, the air does too. And a couple of folks I know with rock dust had to leave her home, get out until the fire was out and they could breathe clean air again. Yes, sirree, boy, it can get pretty bad. It ruins our hunting, our water and air, and we're paying the price for it still. It takes away jobs and leaves the land bare, the fire that burns on the hill. So let's all pitch in, let's put out the fire, cause our time's running out and the cost getting higher. Lots of folks figure to leave the fires to the boys in the fire towers. But them fellas can't do it all by themselves. They need some help. And ain't nobody else to give them help but us. It's a plain fact that spiting them fire towers and rangers and planes and all the rest of the shooting match, us folks down here in just 10 counties of southern West Virginia managed to burn up more woods than all the rest of the state put together. That's awful. Yeah, Tammy. Them rangers needs our help. And by helping them, won't we be helping ourselves? We sure will, Jay. We sure will. There's still time if we all pitch in and help. We can still yet save the forest and some of the thousands of dollars it's been a cost each year to try and repair the damage. One way is to report a fire just as quick as we see it a burning. Call the fire tower or the sheriff or the volunteer fire department if you got a phone. Or if you don't, Get word out somehow, quick as ever you can. Another thing we can do is all lend a hand and help put out the fire. If we can just get them when they're small and everybody pitch right in and help, they're a sight easier to put out. Oh, we gotta pitch in, gotta do something fine. There's a job to be done and we don't have much time. Is time really wearing out, Grandpa? Yep, Jay, we got to do something now. Not just for you kids' daddy and his buddies, but for you and your friends and the young'uns you all have someday. I ain't a superstitious man. Never set much store by lots of things other folks believe. But I know one thing. The good Lord put these trees here in the forest and the birds and the animals for us to use, not to waste. And I can't help but wonder, what's gonna happen if we keep on a-wasting them 
when we know it's wrong. There's still yet time, but we all got to help. We still got trees waiting out here to make us money and places where the forest's healthy and the hunting's good. I can find you places where a man can stand and look pretty nigh up to heaven and still see the tops of trees. We just gotta save them places from fires. It'll sure take a lot of work. Sure, it'll take a lot of work. But if a man asks you for help, you can't hardly turn him down, can you? Special when it's going to help us and our people. How's about it? We'll all help out, won't we? There's a day coming soon when the fire burns no more and our forest will grow on the hill. Our lives will be richer when the land is restored and our forest grows green on the hill. So let's all pitch in, let's put out the fire as our time's running out and the cost getting higher. Let's pitch in and help, let's work for the day when times will be better when the fire's gone away. A couple of things that I've neglected to mention, the, uh, the uh, background music uh, was actually done by the Wheeling Symphony Orchestra. And uh, that was the way that Dennis Stallings spoke. Uh, he's very much a, a, you know, a product of his culture. But uh, I think he was a well-educated gentleman. I know he operated a sawmill business. Uh, he served as board of directors of the Bank of Danville at the time, so well, he was very prominent in the community. Um, I guess it begs the question, or I hope it, it, it raises the question in your mind, why Southern West Virginia? Why was Southern West Virginia, and to a large extent today, the hot spot of the East? Uh, I'm, I'm sure some of you all can remember the fall of 1991, uh, 400,000 acres burned that year. Um, Charleston was, uh, was sucked in by smoke, uh, you know, and I spent a couple of weeks down in Logan, New York County. It's, the problem is a series of very complex uh, social, political, and economic uh, conditions uh, that manifest itself in fire. Uh, I believe a lot of the problem is, is and can be traced back to land ownership patterns that uh, were established at the turn of the century uh, when there was this massive transfer of acreage uh, to out-of-state coal and timber companies. Uh, even today, a lot of folks living throughout southern West Virginia do not even own the land that they live on. Uh, as a result, individuals who do not own that land uh, really have no stake in protecting it. Uh, the general population uh, throughout southern West Virginia really did not ever devour by land or a conservation ethic. These large companies, on the other hand, interested only in coal or other minerals, uh, that was safety, tucked underground by the way, uh, cared very little of what happened in service. I think that initially, and I think most historians would agree to this, coal companies, uh, I'll, I'll use the term, conspired, but they worked with local school boards to make sure that their taxes stayed low, number one. And number two, that the population didn't receive an education. Back in the early days of mining, they needed strong backs and weak minds. And that manifested itself down through generations. Uh, along 
along with that lack of appreciation for land, there was widespread poverty. There were high dropout rates. Uh, even today, 70% of the people that uh, the adults you meet with Dow County do not possess as much as a high, high school education. Of course, there's high unemployment. All of these uh, indirectly contribute to, uh, to the fire problem because for this lack of folks being undereducated has been handed down through the years. It stands to, to reason that uh, if they fail to acquire fundamental educational skills, it's almost impossible for them to assimilate scientific concepts about forest management and fire protection. And that's the reason that some of our best fire prevention efforts have failed. Uh, and not only does it manifest itself in environmental problems like fire, uh, it carries over into other aspects of daily life, and no doubt, I strongly believe it's a contributing factor to the widespread chronic drug problems that exist in many of these southern counties today. Another factor, I think, is that the coal industry has always been characterized by a us-against-them mentality. I've, I've never seen any other industry quite like the coal industry. Um, for the division of management, labels are great. Um, now the prevailing attitude quite often is it's a coal company's land, it's not my problem, let them worry about it. Also, uh, uh, many arson fires are being caused uh, as a result of an individual trying to retaliate against coal companies for one reason or another. Uh, the strict fundamentalist religion that I talked about uh, also has been a very strong uh, contributor. And in, in the beginning, coal companies even perpetuated that. They wanted their preachers to preach to the miners that you shouldn't try to improve your lot in life. You shouldn't try to join their union. Your reward will be in heaven down the road. And that fatalistic attitude, uh, again, is kind of a live for the day attitude. I, I know growing up, I saw a lot of coal miners that drove around new cars and lived in shacks because that instant gratification is more important. And finally, I think another thing that has exacerbated the problem for the years is because of this land ownership pattern, there was no callus for change in southern West Virginia. Uh, I have a friend of mine, uh, he and I have discussed this at length, and, and, and his, uh, his theory is that if you look at any reforms anywhere, anywhere in the world, that have been instituted, it has been done so at the behest of the land owners, the land ownership class. Uh, I think that's an interesting theory, and uh, I think that I, I subscribe to it in, in, in many respects. Uh, you know, with the state coal companies, there are no middle class to push for or institute uh, reforms necessary to bring about social and political changes. Uh, Harry Cotter, if you've ever read, read any of his books, uh, his first book was called Night Comes to the Cumberlands, but he wrote a sequel to that that uh, he uh, it was called Watches of the Night, came along in the 70s. Uh, but he lamented the fact that quite often students that did get an education uh, went to colleges that were located for the most part in the Appalachian Plateau and learned a little more to return home and teach the status quo. Uh, so it's a very difficult, it's a very difficult uh, problem even today. Uh, the division forest, we've never been adequately funded to address fire problem. Uh, the last two years have been real good. They've been wet season, spring and fall both, but uh, we know weather patterns are cyclic. 
we know that there will be another bad fire season and uh, we'll be just as ill prepared to handle it as we were in 1952 or 63 or 64 or any of some of these other years. Uh, but with that, I do appreciate everyone coming out. I, I honestly do. And uh, does anyone have any questions for anything? Sure. Yeah, yeah we, when we talked, uh, you mentioned that many times the, the bad fire seasons were on about a decade. Is that? Yeah, it, it, it's been kind of interesting. Now, now, you know, I think that was probably with climate change and all, I, you know, and I'm no expert. I am, you know, this is an objective thing and I'm, I'm seeing some, some changes. But usually about every 11, 12 years, West Virginia has experienced some very dry uh, periods. Uh, 1930, 31 were real bad fire seasons. 41, 42, 52, I mentioned 50, fall of 52 was the worst season ever recorded. 52, 53, 63, 64. And then it sort of broke up a little bit in the 70s. Uh, the spring of 76, 77 were extremely dry. Uh, at that time, the spring of 1976 was the, the, uh, the worst fire season ever, ever, the worst spring fire season ever recorded in terms of uh, currents. But that fall, uh, you didn't get the, the dry conditions. And then 87, 88 were another bad year. So then there was a couple of abnormalities there. Uh, 91 uh, came along. And then more recently, 2001, which was the last bad fire season that you had in, in West Virginia uh, in, in terms of uh, severity. So we're due for it. Fire prevention, it's, it's very hard, you know, maybe that's one reason I like it, you never know what the, no one can ever prove or done a good or bad job. I, I think that you've seen some long trends, long term trends, that you are seeing a reduction in some numbers, but there's some other things that can, that I think you can attribute to that. Uh, uh, lost population has been one. Uh, they're just not the people that there was once in southern West Virginia. You know, McDowell County had 100,000 people in 1950. That's 22,000 a day. And then an interesting thing, and I'm not sure of why this is, but everywhere that core of the regime was built in southern West Virginia, fire currents dropped. I don't know whether it displaced the fire bugs, uh, whether people, because they were more visible, were more afraid to start a fire, whether they come into contact with outside, you know, influences. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, but, but I do think it, it is help. And uh, a long time ago, a man with the name of Sutton, supposedly he and his wife and three kids lived in Green Street in Sutton, West Virginia. And then there was a huge sycamore there on the uh, part the back of the hill. You know, one other comment I'll, I'll make. I, I will tell you a good story that I, I thought. Now, I left, I left Bingo County in 1980, okay? And uh, sometime in the early 2000s, I came into the office and I had a voicemail message. And this guy tracked me down. And he said, Bean Blossom, he said, I remember when you come around the schools and talk about fires. And I'm tired of them sitting fires up here on this creek, and I know who set this one. And I called him back, got the information, related to the fire investigator with the Division of Forestry, and then we then got the fiction 20 some years later. I 
was several hundred per year. And when they introduced blood hounds into arson investigation, it consecutively dropped to where the occurrences now are approximately set, uh, approximately 12 per year. Now. You, you are absolutely correct, and I forgot that one. I really had. Um, the the uh, Bill Maxey, who I mentioned earlier, the state forester at the time, and Bill put the idea of acquiring the bloodhound. And it's not that bloodhounds are that successful in tracking out, or tracking down firebugs, although they are very successful. But the perception of tracking you down is far, far greater. And arson and fires that significantly dropped. That arson always historically was the number one cause of fire in West Virginia. It's the number two now behind the debris burning. That's had a big impact, and I forgot that. Okay, thank you all for coming out. I appreciate it.